And let us unite together in the public worship of God as we sing to God's praise in Psalm 145. We're singing the first verse of the psalm and we'll sing down to verse 8. Verses that are full of God's praise. In that sense, it's a very appropriate psalm to, to open worship with. Uh, and uh, also, as we see down towards verse 8, particularly this clear reference to God's grace, his compassion, his loving kindness. I'll thee extol my God, O King. I'll bless thy name always. Thee will I bless each day, and will thy name forever praise. Great is the Lord, much to be praised. His greatness search exceeds. Race unto race shall praise thy works, and show thy mighty deeds. I of thy glorious majesty the honor will record. I'll speak of all thy mighty works, which wondrous are, O Lord, Men of thine acts, the might shall show thine acts that dreadful are, and I thy glory to advance, thy greatness will declare. One through eight, I'll be extol, my God, O King. <coughs>
unite together in prayer. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we do pray that the words we have sung together at the outset of worship this morning would set the tone for all that we engage in, that these words would inform our minds, reminding us again of some of these great truths, refreshing us and instructing us. And we acknowledge, O oh Lord, our great need of instruction as we come in worship. We are so cold at times to spiritual things, so ignorant of spiritual things, so prone to err and stumble. And so we pray today, as we always do, for the leading and the guiding of the Lord by his Spirit. And that indeed in our worship and through our worship, not only will we know blessing and instruction and light, but that the Lord will be glorified. And we do pray, O Lord, that that would be a great concern for us, the glory of God, for that is our chief end, our principal duty, and when we discover it, our greatest joy. We come, eternal Lord, and we give thanks for all thy blessings toward us in the week that has gone. We look back and we see many things for which we have cause to be thankful. And we give thanks above all else that as a new week begins, we gather, it around the, we gather together around the word of God. And we find ourselves again at these great cardinal truths. We find ourselves again opening God's word and being reminded of our need, being shown of our fall and of the trouble and damage that sin has done in this world, but being directed to Christ, that great Saviour, the one who was long promised, the one that the Old Testament spoke of again and again, the one who would come, and the one who in the pages of the New Testament we discover did come, and fulfilled every promise that was given, undertook every duty that was laid before him, dying in the place of sinners, though he had no sin, in order to open up by substitution the way of peace and the way of pardon to all who will receive it. And we give thanks, O Lord, for every soul who has come to discover in their own hearts and souls that these things are not merely old truths, but fresh truth. And that the word of God that speaks to us of these things bears a true witness. We rejoice, O Lord, in every soul who has found in Christ a Savior mighty to save, who has found in Christ one who is able for his own sake to pardon their sin and who brings them into a new and living relationship with himself. We pray, Lord, for all of God's people today, wherever they are found under the sun, remember them and strengthen them. It is not an easy life in many ways to be following the Lord. It has its own cross and its own burdens, but oh, it has blessings that are incomparable. Remember them, Lord, and keep them from temptation within and without. Keep them from stumbling, keep them from falling, and grant that their lives and their witness may speak volumes to the world around them, and may demonstrate that there is a depth and a reality to it all beyond mere words and mere sermon. We pray, Lord, for those of them who are struggling, struggling with ill health, struggling with sorrows and troubles, 
struggling in many places with opposition and even persecution. Undertake, O Lord, for them. Be a stay and a help. And grant that they may know the consolation and the promises of God's word as particularly relevant and precious to their situation. For the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation. His hands will also finish it. We pray for any who are searching and seeking today. And there are many such in the world who have come to the conclusion that there must be more to life than the mere physical things of this world. Who see around them the evidence of God's creating power. And who are drawn to the things of God. We pray that that drawing may be a heavenly drawing and that indeed they may come to taste and see for themselves that God is good, who trusts in him is blessed. Remember those who are far away from the things of God, who have little thought of it even today. We pray, Lord, that they would be drawn and called and that we would see lives transformed by the glorious work of God's Spirit, that we would see a reviving work in many hearts and a reforming work in many lives. Remember all our homes and all our families. We pray for our loved ones wherever they are. And we pray for those in the wider family here of the congregation and of the community. Remember us, O Lord, for good. We pray thy blessing, eternal one, upon the work of the gospel amongst ourselves here, within our bounds as a presbytery, and beyond that into the wider church, in our own denomination and far beyond our limited borders. We pray for all who love the Lord Jesus Christ in truth and in sincerity. We pray for all who preach that same message today. May it be a word of God unto salvation to many a soul. Remember, Lord, we pray our foreign missionary interests. We think of our friends in Sri Lanka and we give thanks for even recent encouragements in the work there. We pray for the presbytery in France and Spain and the fledgling work in Portugal. We pray, Lord, for the fall of the kingdom of darkness. It is at work and it is busy, but it is doomed, for Christ is the victor. He has brought out victory even at Calvary itself. For there, though he was crucified in weakness, there the enemy is crushed, and it is but a matter of time until the work of darkness is brought to nothing, until every injustice is corrected, and until all of these things are folded up in the glory of Christ's return and in the wonder of his kingdom. We pray thy blessing then, Lord, upon us. Lead us and keep us and guard us. We pray for those who govern us. We are to remember them in prayer, and we do so. We pray for the, the king in his own concerns with his health and others in that family as well. We pray for our prime minister and our first minister. We pray for local representatives in Holyrood and Westminster. We pray for local government. We pray for the executive, the legislator, the judiciary. We pray for all that makes up the fabric and waft and woof and waft and woof of national life and all that is uh, central to us. We give thanks for the many benefits and blessings that we have many of them bound up to the gospel and to the witness of the gospel and to the pages of scripture. O oh Lord, we pray that we would be kept, that we would be brought back to thyself and that our empty churches would again be filled and that empty hearts would again be filled and empty lives would be transformed, that we would see the work and the power of God eh, across this nation of ours. Be with us now, Lord, we pray. Open our hearts to the word. Open our understanding to it. Give us ears that are ready to hear and hearts that receive it like water to dry ground. Receive our worship. Cleanse our sin. We come with a burden of our guilt and we are laid at the cross. There is a fountain filled with blood and we are thankful that in that fountain cleansing is found. We are thankful that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We are thankful that we can come and our sins against the first table of the law 
our failure to honor and love the Lord, our failure against the second table of the law, our duty to those around us. And we fail in all of these things, but yet in our failing, we find deep consolation. For there is forgiveness and pardon and restoring grace. In Christ, our Passover lamb, our great high priest, in his name we come, on his blessed merits we stand. Make him more precious to us than ever before. Help us to see his glory, to see his beauty, and to see his grace, to feel his love in our hearts, and to feel our hearts in turn going out to him for his name's sake. Amen. <clears throat> We're going to read just now in the scriptures of the Old Testament and in the book of the prophet Isaiah, we're going to read in chapter 53. Isaiah in chapter 53. Now, you know that the Old Testament is full of prophecies and promises about the Lord Jesus Christ. All of them hundreds of years before he came some of them a thousand years and more before he came. Some of them are particularly clear and unmistakable and quite long. Others of them are shorter and briefer. But this 53rd chapter of Isaiah is perhaps of them all one of the clearest. And as we read it, we cannot but reflect on these Old Testament believers who, who must have often wondered what all of this meant. Who is this talking about? And only as we turn to our New Testaments do we realize that Jesus Christ is here in every verse. Well, Isaiah 53 from verse 1 then. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet... It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. You see, although the chapter almost all the way down is full of suffering and uh, ultimately the death, the crucifixion of Christ, yet the chapter ends on a high note 
a note of triumph, a note of victory. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And we trust the Lord to follow with his own blessing that reading of his word. Well, we turn again to sing and we're going to sing in Psalm 22 and verse 11. And this is one of these other Old Testament passages which spoke beforehand, a long time beforehand, of the sufferings of Christ. And um, some of the predictions in this psalm are, are wonderfully clear and precise. <clears throat> We're going to sing from verse 11. Be not far off, for grief is near, and none to help is found. Bulls many compass me, strong bulls of Bashan me surround. He's comparing his enemies there to, to wild bulls, and apparently the bulls of Bashan were particularly noted for their ferocity. Their mouths they opened wide on me, upon me gaped did they like to a lion ravening and roaring for his prey. Like water I am poured out, my bones all out of joint to part, amidst my bowels as a wax so melted as my heart. My strength is like a potsherd dried. He's, he, he, he's, he, he's dry. And well, when we come to the cross, we, 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 we see that so, so clearly portrayed. My tongue, it cleaveth fast unto my jaws. To the dust thou brought me hast. And then in the next verse, the picture changes again. It's not lions or, or bulls. It's, it's dogs. And it's, it's the wild city dogs. For dogs have compassed me about. The wicked that did meet in their assembly me enclosed. Then how, how accurate these words, they pierced my hands and feet. The Old Testament believers must have wondered, many a long year, what did that mean? Why are they piercing his hands and feet? We don't do that. And only when we come to New Testament times and crucifixion, do we discover what that verse meant. They pierced my hands and feet. I all my bones may tell. They do upon me look and stare. And then we have this verse, upon my vesture lots they cast, and close among them share. Remember, that's exactly what the soldiers did at the cross. They shared their clothes, and they shared, shared bits of it, but there was one part that they didn't want to just rip and share, so they cast lots for it. How it's so accurate, it's so clear, isn't it? It's, it? It almost feels like you're reading a New Testament passage here. Well, from 11 through 18, be not far off, for grief is near. Be not far off, for grief is near. Oh uh -huh. 
Well, friends, as we come now to God's Word and seek the light of God's Spirit on it, we turn once more to the New Testament Scriptures, to the Gospel according to Mark, and we continue our studies this morning in this part of God's Word. Now, if you were here last Lord's Day, you will remember that we looked at verses 27 to 29. We come this morning to the section from 30 down to 33, but I'm going to read from verse 27 because uh, the two sections are uh, intimately tied together, as we'll see in a moment. So reading there at verse 27 of Mark chapter 8, and Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples them, whom do men say that I am? And they answered, they give him a, a sample of public opinion at the time, and they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. The answers, as we saw last week, were very vague and uncertain. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Peter answered and said unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. And we come now to these next verses. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priests and scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke that saying openly and Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned about and looked on his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savourest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. <clears throat> well, the verses that we have just read speak volumes, do they not, about the truthfulness and the integrity of the Bible. If we were trying to put the Bible together as a human document, a mere book that we had invented, and a book that would convince the world of the truth of the claims of the apostles about Christ, we would omit anything which would show, that's probably the best word, we would omit anything which would show any mistakes on their part. And if we included any such mistakes, any such incidents, we would be very sure that they would be just very mild examples, the sort that could be easily brushed aside and explained away. And it is certain that we would not, on any account, include what we find in these verses that we just read, where we see the Lord administering this stinging rebuke to Peter and, in a way, to them all. Now, this rebuke that the Lord gives to Peter here comes hard on the heels of the passage that we studied last Lord's Day. And that passage really took us to a high point in the understanding of Peter and the other disciples. The Lord asks them what people generally thought about him, and they really uh, a sample of public opinion and it's all very vague one of the prophets but then he turns the question on themselves just as he turns it on us of course but what about you what do you have to say and we have Peter's great confession there in verse 29 that Jesus was the Christ and we saw that that was one of the titles of Jesus that it was, it meant the promised Messiah, 
the long-promised Savior. Well, we're going to go from that high point and we're going to dip down pretty low as we look at what happens here. But the two events are intimately tied up together. So what do we have in these verses uh, 31 to 33? Well, first of all, in these verses, we have the imminence of the cross. Now, little ones who are here, you might not know what that word means. If something is imminent, it's very close. If something is five minutes away, it's imminent. If something is a hundred years away, it's not imminent. Well, what we have here is the cross of Jesus Christ and it was imminent, or in other words, it was close. Now they had said in verse 28, as we saw a moment ago, you are the Christ. And he, he acknowledges that. He says, yes, that is correct. And that would have filled their hearts with joy and hopeful anticipation. This was wonderful. And as far as they were concerned, now that he has come, well, everything's going to go great. All will be well. Things will go on just like this. He'll perform some more miracles. He'll grow in popularity. Might even be crowned as, as king in Jerusalem. Might even sweep out the invading Roman army. But as they're beginning to reflect on these daydreams, the Lord has to bring to their attention what it meant for him to be the Christ. And any focus on some sort of earthly kingdom with earthly problems and earthly enemies was wrong. Yes, he says, you are correct. I am the Christ. And that means that up ahead and coming closer every day is the cross of Calvary. The cross was imminent. Verse 29, thou art the Christ. Verse 31, and he began to teach them, the son of man must suffer many things and then at the end of the verse, be killed. The imminence of the cross. Now what would the cross involve for Christ? Well we're told three things in this verse about the cross. We're told first of all that it would involve terrible sufferings. You see it says in the verse he must suffer many things. Now, it would be enough for us to suffer one thing wouldn't it? or two things, or a few things, but it's many things. He is going to suffer many things. He's going to be rejected, we're told in the verse. He's going to be killed. Yes, he was the Christ. He was a prophet, and that pleased them. He was the prophet, and that pleased them. Yes, he, the Christ, was the king, and that pleased them, and that delighted them. The Christ is also a priest and a priest who's going to offer up himself as a sacrifice. So it involved terrible sufferings, but we see as well here that it involved unavoidable sufferings. You notice that word in the verse. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things must what did christ mean by by must <clears throat> did it mean that all this was forced on him against his will well that's what happens with us sometimes you know there's, there's little people who might not always want to go to school but they must go to school they might not want to eat their food but they must eat their food well there's a must about it isn't there is that the way it was here? Is he being forced against his will? Well, that's impossible. 
because he is the eternal son of God. What does he mean by must? He means this, that these sufferings and that that death were necessary. They were unavoidable in order to atone for his people's sins, in order to open up the way for peace and reconciliation, he must. This must is the divine plan. He must because this is God's way of delivering men and women who trust in Christ from the guilt and the burden and the shame of their sin and bringing them into a place where they are no longer under the condemnation of God. All these Old Testament sacrifices, they all pointed forward. They were all saying there must, there must be the shedding of blood. They pointed forward to his impending death. Psalm 69, Psalm 22 that we sang a moment ago, they all said must, all the way through the Old Testament. It's got must written all over it. It's unavoidable. What did we read in Isaiah 53? Did it say maybe this will happen, this possibly might? It's got must written all over it. Every verse, it's certain, it's clear. John the Baptist said he must. If his people are to be pardoned, if they are to have peace with God, if they are ever to get to heaven, he must. It's no might, it's no maybe. He must. Terrible sufferings, unavoidable sufferings, but notice this as well, they're temporary sufferings. Death is not the end. Look at the end of verse 31. After three days, rise again. He's predicting his resurrection. He's predicting the time of his resurrection. There's nothing vague about any of this. He would suffer for a time. The wrath due to his people would be condensed into a short period of time. He would pay their debt. He would take the penalty. And then it would be finished. Before the crown, says Christ, there lies the cross, and that's the abiding principle that his people must learn, of course. We don't have to look further than verse 34 to discover that. But I mustn't get into that just now. So that's the first thing we have in these verses. We have the imminence of the cross. Jesus is showing the disciples and showing us through the word that it was absolutely essential. And that every day as he lived his ministry, it was getting closer. We have the imminence of the cross. But then secondly, we have the offense of the cross. The offense of the cross. <clears throat> it was an offense, first of all, to Peter. It was an offense to Peter. Peter loved the Lord. And Peter could not bear what he was hearing. He couldn't bear the thought of him having to suffer and die. And apart from that, for Peter, um, any idea of messiahship that involved death and, and apparent defeat, it was quite apparent. Any messiahship that excluded sufferings and included execution, that had little place in Peter's thinking at that time. So what does he do? Well, Peter being Peter, he pulls the Lord aside and he, he's going to have a quiet word with him. He begins to rebuke him, we're told. He will show the Lord a better way. Oh, he says, you're talking about my, listen, it doesn't need to be like that. The cross was an offense to Peter. 
And the cross is still offensive. If Christ is just an example of kindness, a wrongly put to death victim, well, Peter, people generally can accept that. But when we begin to explain that it's about substitution and about sin, people are generally unwilling to accept that, unwilling to accept that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. They want to have Jesus, but it's a Jesus without the cross and with no shedding of blood. But you know, there's no Jesus without the cross and without the shedding of blood. I remember my mind's just going back years ago to a, a, a sort of panel group that I took part in on a Gaelic television program. It's probably 25 years ago. And along with me on the panel, and he was a very nice man indeed, um, although we disagreed on this point, was somebody who was um, uh, very well versed in, 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 in some of these things and in, in literature and so on. And we agreed on certain things, but then it came to this, this, this matter of the shedding of Christ's blood, the cross, the, the necessity of the cross. And there he and I, as it were, parted ways. A cross, a Jesus without the cross, without death, without, without any of these things, that was fine. Well, that's, that's what Peter wanted as well. And we'll see in a moment what the Lord had to say about it. It was an offense to Peter. I wonder if it's an offense to you. Is the cross an offense to you? Oh, no, you say, it's, it's, it's not an offense to me. Well, here's the test. Let's, let's do a litmus test. Would you be just as happy with no cross? Would you be just as happy if there was no preaching of the cross, if there was no preaching on, on, on the necessity of the cross? Well, you say, maybe I would. <laughs> then it's an offense to you. For Christ crucified, for the Christian that is central to all their hopes. The Christian can't be happy with no cross and no preaching of the cross. That's the bread and butter of their Christian life. But the Lord knew full well that behind poor Peter, somebody else was standing. Satan was at work. And so the cross is not only an offense to Peter, it's an offense to Satan. He hated the cross and he hates the preaching of the cross. And here he is using Peter as a vehicle, as he did on previous occasions, to turn the Lord's mind away from the cross, to turn that must into a maybe, and then to turn the maybe into a never. We have the imminence of the cross. We have the offense of the cross. Peter begins to rebuke him and says, no, no, let, let's not go down that road. Thirdly, we have the defense of the cross. We have the defense of the cross. The Lord defends the cross from Peter's folly. Matthew Henry puts it like this. The wisdom of man is perfect folly when it pretends to improve on divine counsel. He defends the cross. He defends the cross from Satan's attack. Here's Satan once more attempting to turn Jesus away from the cross, tempting him even as he did in, in that great temptation episode, to avoid it all with all its suffering. Because he knew, Satan knew, that that cross was his defeat and his destruction, as surely as it was the hope and the redemption of God's people. And Jesus sees Satan at work. He begins to rebuke him. Verse 33, 
32. But when he turned and looked on the disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan. You don't have a taste for the things of God, for the things of men. Peter, you fail to grasp something absolutely crucial. Did you not notice, Peter? I said, must. The defense of the cross. Without the cross, there is no good news. Without the cross, there is no way or path of reconciliation. We need Christ, and we need Christ crucified. Well, what does all of this tell us? Well, can I leave three practical points with you? First of all, it tells us that the most earnest believer can get things wrong. The most earnest believer can get things wrong. You know, Peter is a lesson to every Christian to be humble. Somebody said to me after the Lord's Day service last week, Peter is my favorite disciple. Yes, I know exactly what you mean. But he is a lesson to every Christian to be humble and never to think we know it all. We are poor, fallible creatures. We're like Peter. We're full of ignorance and we're full of self-conceit. He thought he knew better than the Lord. And we read it here and we're shocked. And at there are times we think we know better than the Lord. And at there are times when we would correct him and correct his providence. And at there are times when we at least harbor doubts about his plans and his purposes. Or oh, Peter did it with the best intention. It was well meant. But he got it wrong. And he's teaching us humility, but he's teaching us something else as well. Patience with others when they get it wrong. That's the first practical lesson I'm going to leave you with. The most earnest believer can get things wrong. Secondly, the most wonderful confession can be followed by the most terrible stumbling. The most wonderful confession can be followed by the most terrible stumbling. Peter goes from the high of verse 29 to the low of verse 23, and it's a matter of a few lines between them. And you know, again, this humbles us, this warns us, we're just a, a moment away from error. We're just a moment away from grievous error. We're only a moment away from becoming a stumbling block to the Lord's cause. We're only a moment away from being a tool and a mouthpiece of Satan. Let's not be puffed up. Let's not be puffed up with our own spiritual insights and attainments. Peter has just been granted a great insight. And Peter has just been highly praised. And I don't know, it doesn't say it here, but maybe Peter's head swelled a little. Maybe Peter was a bit puffed up. And maybe that's why he was so bold as to take the Lord aside and try to correct him. I don't know. But I do know that Peter came crashing down. The most earnest believer can get things wrong. The most wonderful confession can be followed by the most terrible stumbling. But surely the greatest lesson of all is this. The most undeserving sinner can be saved. <clears throat> that is pardon for the foulest sin. How did Peter feel when he heard these words? Well, he must have felt frightened. He must have felt depressed. He must have felt an absolute failure. And maybe Peter is thinking, well, that's the end of me as a disciple. Not at all. Peter can be pardoned. His folly, his error, his presumption. And why can Peter be pardoned? Because of what the Savior did for him on that cross. 
the cross that Peter was so keen the Savior would avoid was the only thing that could bring any hope to poor Peter. He's looking at things as he sometimes did from the wrong end. And he wasn't the first. And he'll not be the last. The most undeserving sinner can be saved because Christ went to the cross. Because he took the place of the sinner. And because he extends to everyone, whoever, whatever, that open opportunity of pardon and peace. Come unto me, he says, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. The guilt and all of it can be taken away because of that cross. Thank God for the cross today. Thank God that he persevered. Thank God that there was a must. That he must suffer. That he must die. That he must rise again. And that at the very heart of the gospel. There is a God of grace. In his son. Reconciling sinner. To himself. The imminence of the cross. The offense of the cross. The defense of the cross. May God bless his word. Let us pray. Eternal Lord, we give thanks that there is a cross. That it's there in the Old Testament promised and foreshadowed in sacrifice and much else. That it's there in the New Testament that 2,000 years ago, long after these promises were first uttered, the eternal Son of God became man and lived, yes, and died on that cross of Calvary and rose again, a prince and a saviour, to give repentance and remission of sin. We give thanks that there is a must to that cross and that that must was carried through to its final degree. And that through that cross, the door of opportunity for peace and pardon is extended to all who will take it. That we, whoever we are, can be reconciled to God by the death of his son. Help us, Lord, to avoid Peter's mistake. Help us, Lord, to a, learn from him and in turn to learn from the Lord himself. Be with us as we sing our closing praise. Receive our thanks and cover our sin for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, we're going to sing in another one of these Old Testament prophetic passages, Psalm 69. We're going to sing from verse 30 down to 34. Now Psalm 69, just like 22, begins on a low note. The sufferings of Christ, they are set out for us verse by verse. In verse 21, for instance, it speaks of him being given vinegar to drink when he was thirsty and so on. But then by the time we come to verse 30, the tide has turned and hope and joy and gladness because of Christ's death is coming to the fore. The name of God I with a song most cheerfully will praise, and I in giving thanks to him, his name shall highly raise. Four verses to, 32, to 34, the name of God.
Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion and fellowship of God the Holy Spirit rest on with rest on and abide with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. Well, friends, just a couple of um, intimations. God willing, our evening service at six o'clock, and we'll continue our studies in Second Samuel. Prayer meetings this week, Wednesday in the hall and Saturday online, both at 7 p.m. And as usual, our Saturday meeting will include our studies in William Garnell's Christian in Complete Armour. Services next Lord's Day will follow the usual pattern. As it's the first Lord's Day of March, there'll be a Gaelic service at 11 a.m. and then 12 and 6, of course, later. I expect to be here for all these services. The Presbytery meets on Tuesday in Portree for the examination of records and for ordinary business later on. And a bit of an advanced intimation, the Portree communion season will be held on the second Lord's Day of March. So that'll be two weeks from today. Services will begin on Thursday, uh, Thursday the 7th. They'll follow the pattern that Portree folk have adopted in more recent times. There'll be a service on Thursday night and Friday night and Saturday 12 noon and so on. Now, I'm not entirely sure about some of the preparatory services, but the main preacher over the weekend will be the Reverend Andrew Allen from Partick, Glasgow. And you'll remember that no service is here that Lord's Day. That's two weeks from today. And that, of course, like everything else, is subject to the will and the appointing.